Welcome to this first module on human dignity. We have seen that there are a number of versions or definitions of dignity that have been used in the past. We're focusing on human dignity here. And we're going to use the unconditional notion of dignity, even though you will see that uh, in the perspective that we're taking here, it is not a philosophical approach, it's more an evolutionary approach. And we've seen, of course, around the globe that there are a number of crises, and the crisis that you are dealing with specifically is one of them, migration. Uh, people are moving more from one place to another uh, because they can't survive where they are. Albert Einstein gets credit for many uh, BOMOs, and here is one of them. Problems cannot be solved with the same mindset that created them. And uh, in that sense, we're looking at a new way to looking at the source of the issues that we are facing as a species. We have a dominant view, I assert, of what we think us human beings to be and what we share, what we have in common. In the traditional literature, this view is called homo economicus. In, uh, in other perspectives, it gets um, a, a different name. It could be called psychopaths or sociopaths. Um, we're going to go there in a moment. But this is a fundamental challenge to all organizations, I assert, uh, including administrations that are built on some model of who we are as human beings and that enables and at the same time limits them in terms of how they can approach and solve problems. We all use metaphors, images, and experiences to understand ourselves and others. And so these uh, models of uh, Scrooge McDuck, etc., are certainly a way of understanding ourselves as human beings in a, in a fun way, um, looking at money, etc., 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 as the main objective or power or status. In the context of uh, the models, metaphors, we have used others. And I'm just going to share two background narratives that will hopefully elucidate the challenge that we're facing and the point in which dignity can really make a, an enormous difference as a foundational concept. I call the story of Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge or Scrooge McDuck um, the economistic story, the story of Homo economicus. And I will share with you what I call a humanistic story that's based on Homo sapiens, who we are as human beings from an evolutionary perspective that latches on to many of the other perspectives that we have uh, come up with in the past, but it is not the dominant narrative right now. The dominant narrative is the narrative I argue, of human nature that tells us that we are rational, utility maximizing, and self-interested, possibly amoral uh, and opportunistic with guile. That is indeed the hardcore foundation on which economic organization rests, marketplace organizations, etc., etc. So in the context of Homo economicus, there is nothing that possesses, possesses unconditional inherent value. Dignity does not exist. In the, as a consequence of the economistic story, we are assuming that we all we want is money, power, and status, and that we have some kind of a structure that we can use to process how we get more money, power, and status. Now, money, power, and status are important, for sure. But uh, they are not the only motivators that drive human beings. In fact, they're not the only ones that uh, account for our survival. Yet we have built organizations around that, uh, mostly in a command and control structure style, to limit um, what we believe is the maximization drive of human beings for power, status, and money. And administrations typically are run in a command and control structure for that reason, for that purpose. Another way to look at this, though, which puts dignity into the center, is a 
view of human beings around four drives that are evolutionary, that are inbuilt in our brain, supported through our development. And I'm just going to very quickly share this here. We can go and we will go into more detail. The original drives that we have, as we share with all living beings, are the drive to acquire what we need to survive and to defend those. You can see that here as the drive to acquire and the drive to defend, D-A-D-D. And uh, according to evolutionary um, scientists, anthropologists, our prior species, Homo habilis, Australopithecus, and others, have all survived because they had the drive to acquire food and the, the drive to defend themselves. Now, they also died out, and only a very, very small group survived, which we now label Homo erectus. And what we know from why were they able, why was Homo erectus able to survive and Homo habilis was not, it was two key inventions that allow us to, well, master fire and work together as tribes. We became tribal. And then from then on, our brain basically grew into a size that would allow us to process tribal complex relationships. That's what many people attribute our survival to as Homo erectus. And so there is a third drive, the drive to bond, to make relationships work that is inherent in us, according to this account. Now, Homo erectus died out as well, and Homo sapiens replaced basically all other human species, including Neanderthals, etc., etc., because arguably we had a fourth drive that our brain allowed us to utilize, which is the drive to comprehend. We started to ask questions, why can you not do this with an instrument? How can you potentially solve this problem? By asking these questions, the abstract prefrontal cortex was developed and we were able to recognize patterns, find more, uh, develop more sophisticated instruments, tools, such as the computer, etc., etc. All of those are outcomes of us questioning why and this drive to comprehend is what Paul Lawrence and others labeled, the fourth drive, the drive that makes us sapiens. And in that context, the acquisition of material is important, the defense of material is important, but more so, or equally so, is that we are able to bond and that we're able to understand the world around us. This is sort of our ancestors, and they did not need to necessarily work together as much as we do now. Climate change basically caused them to move away from the trees, the protection of the trees, into the savanna, move upright, and that they could only do when they were working together because all the other uh, animals were much bigger and larger and could easily uh, prey on our species or our predecessor species. Now, what we have developed, as I said, is the drive to bond in tribes and work together. So that starts from having kids and a nuclear family to working together to hunt, to guard fire, etc., etc. In fact, fire was seen as a key evolutionary driver in a way that it allowed us to both uh, um, cook food, store food, and then coordinate life around fire. And of course, from an evolutionary perspective, any person that would be able to socialize better would overall contribute to a better fit in the environment. Now, here's a, just a little chart in terms of the brain growth. And our cranial capacity has grown over time and arguably to process social relationships and to do better and higher levels of abstract thinking so we can adapt to changing circumstances. Homo erectus, uh, chances of survival improved by fire, by bigger prey and by bigger brains. They had a nuclear family and they had tribal bonding, which we say is an independent drive to bond. 
as I said, the drive to comprehend is another independent drive. You can see that we're, we love to play games. We love to pursue trivial <laughs> knowledge. We have developed religions to give us answers to the question why we are here. We write books, we make movies, we tell stories. That is so foundational to the human species that we almost forget it. Um, but it's important to understand ultimately what does it mean to be human and therefore dignified. By Homo sapiens increased his survival chances by abstract thinking, which supports innovation, storytelling, which supports learning, and created shared meaning with, for example, religious narratives or other creation narratives. We ask the question why, and meaning making is critical to us. And it's an independent drive, independent of bonding, independent of acquisition, and independent of defense, even though it can support those. Now, the real critical shift here, and this is where dignity comes back to play, when we ask what makes us human, it is most of the evidence points to a balance of those four drives is when we feel human. There's a minimum threshold where we say we have enough to eat, we're safe enough, we have important relationships like family or friends, and we have a reason why we're here, some kind of uh, purpose. That is when human beings flourish according to this humanistic perspective. It is not when they have power, money, and status only. Now, power, money, and status do matter, but they matter in terms of a balancing act here. So if we understand dignity as the balance of these four drives, then what we would need to focus on is that we see that we balance what we need to survive in terms of food, sex, status, recognition, etc., with what we need to feel good in terms of trust, respect, and care, with what we need to make sense of the world in terms of purpose, meaning, or religious affiliations, with the need to be safe physically and psychologically. Now this is quite a challenge and this is where management administration <laughs> and all of uh, the leadership literature is converging on this is what makes a good leader a good organization an organization where people feel valued and have their dignity um, honored and protected now this evolutionary perspective just as a background actually matches very neatly up with the uh, insights from philosophy and theology of the shared religions over time and the natural science as well. Darwin called morality a survival mechanism. Most people don't know that. Uh, Aristotle calls social uh, people so on politicon, social animals endowed with reason, social speaking to the drive to bond, animal to the drive to acquire and the drive to defend, and reason to the drive to comprehend. Uh, shared religious narratives are showcasing that there is such a global ethic could be established in human rights or in this notion of human dignity. Human dignity has been the foundation of the human rights narrative in the sense that there are certain basic needs or drives that need to be addressed to make us feel of valued or human. So again, the balance of the four drives is that which allows us to feel dignified and then also which allows us to feel a higher level of flourishing. All the serious literature on human flourishing can be categorized into these four drives in terms of that we need a higher purpose, that we need good social relationships, we need to have enough to eat, we need to feel psychologically and physically safe. Those are the categories. And we can see this in those studies. We can see this maybe when you reflect on when, when were you the happiest and most satisfied. Um, and then most often it will, we will argue, you can explain it by this balancing of the four drives. We know from team research that in a very similar way, the high performing teams all have independent drives in balance. They have a shared purpose, they establish trust, they have the skills and resources that they need, and they create physical and psychological safety. 
here's just some of the research to under, uh, pin that. I don't need to go into much more detail, but when you get the, the slides, you can you can look that up if you want. The interesting thing is that, of course, if balancing was so easy, then why would we have those problems? Balance is very hard. But what is, for example, happening when we are imbalancing? We're showcasing just a number of, of ways in which we're violating our own dignity sometimes, and therefore then oftentimes at the extreme suffer from it. Here's an imbalance with the drive to acquire. If you want too much, too much, too much, if you're potentially a psychopath like Bernie Madoff arguably is sociopath, then when found out, you either are in prison for a long time or sometimes even in some cultures there is a death penalty. So too much of that is not good for society, so oftentimes that way we try to regulate it. Also, our body reacts to an imbalance in a way. The picture next to Bernie Madoff is an intern who worked too hard um, in an internship for an investment bank and then died out of uh, from exhaustion. So clearly, if you are interested or too much interested in acquisition and therefore then uh, deny yourself all the other uh, set the drives, then um, you probably are not very fit to survive. And that's not to be cynical. That's just a, a basic fact. Same thing can happen when the imbalance occurs around the drive to bond. If you elevate and maximize your socialization, like in gangs or you could say the Nazis or any kind of tribal uh, elevation for you, we are better, we are first <laughs> over anybody else, most often come, uh, creates conflicts or death as a result. Similar thing happens with the drive to comprehend. If you put ideology above anything else, say the crusaders or jihadists or kamikaze fighters, all of those from an evolutionary perspective are not very fit in survival uh, because they maximize one drive over the other. Here is the drive to defend. The drive to defend is sometimes a little harder to imagine, but if you, for example, are so threatened, you build yourself a castle, marry very many walls, or like the Yuna bomber that, that is pictured here, see the world as, as threatening and you wanna uh, liberate it by bombing, uh, then most likely that kind of imbalance isn't uh, helping your own survival either or it will threaten the survival of others. So a maximization there as well is not evolutionary fit. The same thing can happen in teams. We know that teams that don't work well have low psychological safety. People are not speaking up. People communicate generally only to avoid conflict, but there's a lot of fear. Uh, people do not like each other. Uh, there are some outsiders, people do not trust each other, there is no consensus on the purpose or the direction of the team, or there is very low accountability towards performance goals. If all of these or just some of those are in place, typically a team does not work well. Now, you have organizations that work well, I just put a couple up here, but they would basically be argued to have a culture with dignity a dignity culture in place. They balance the four drives. They honor the drive to bond, they honor the drive to comprehend, they honor the drive to acquire, and the drive to defend in a balanced manner. When they are an imbalance, then you see oftentimes these kind of scandals. Uh, not always is it as dramatic as here, but uh, in many organizations, there is some kind of imbalance and we argue that through the dignity lens, possibly with the four drive theory backed up, you can identify where those imbalances are and then adjust. As closing thoughts, I want to provide you with that we all use metaphors, images, and experience to understand ourselves and others. Even though the four drive model is scientifically grounded, 
it is just a model. It is a map. We argue that it's a map that has dignity as the balance of the four drives at its center, at the individual level, the group level, the organizational level, and even the societal level. And it can allow leaders, managers, yourself to, to increase and understand how you can have more dignified relationships with yourself, with others, and with the people around you. With that, I will close, and I'm looking forward to your questions.